Good morning, everyone. It is a blessing to be with you, to you here today that we can open up again God's inspired word, that we can study from it, that we can take the many lessons and blessings and things that can be helpful to us, that can be challenging to us, that we can take these things, we can study them and strive to apply them to our lives and look at our great and glorious God and the things that he has done for us and continues to do for us. If you will this morning, open up your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to go over an account that many of us may be very familiar with, and we've studied at different points of our lives. The kids may be familiar with this because they've often studied it in the kids' classes, depending on the age groups. This was my brother's favorite account when he was growing up, because his name also happened to be the namesake of the prophet that we're going to look at this morning. And that is the account of Daniel in the lion's den. As you look at Daniel chapter 6, oftentimes when we talk about Daniel, we talk about the Daniel of Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2. We talk about Madrach, Mad, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We talk about the young men and what it must have been like for them to come out of Israel and out of Judah during the time period when they were very young men to be thrust into the kingdom and under the king of the very men who took their kingdom, who slaughtered their people, their rulers. And how the turmoil must have been as young men to wonder, where is God? What is he doing for us? What's going on? Now we're under these trials and tribulations, even serving the very man who did this to us. And we look at their faith as young men as also in line with men like Timothy and Titus in the New Testament. And we take courage that from a young age they stood for the truth. But the other side of this we see in Daniel chapter 6 as well. By the time we get to Daniel chapter 6, he is, some accounts will say, close to his 80s. It is very late in his lifespan at this point. We have seen brethren, friends, and loved ones who were faithful when they were young, but as they grew older, as they got towards retirement age, towards the end of their life, and they wondered what I imagine Daniel and his friends wondered from time to time, where is God? What is he doing? I feel abandoned. I don't know if I still have the faith and belief that I used to, and so I'm going to abandon what God has done for me. There have been many loved ones and brethren that have lost the way towards the end of their life. It's just as encouraging to me also when we go to Daniel chapter 6 that now we're going to see the faith of an old man. And it really hasn't changed. In all likelihood, it's grown stronger. His relationship with God has not waned. We still have a strong faith here from Daniel. And... While he had some challenges that we see in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2, I can't imagine the challenges of what it would be like to be as a young man, likely a teenager, where your entire world and kingdom and lifestyle is destroyed by an enemy force and now you're serving him. But the challenges he's going to face in Daniel chapter 6 are less now about what happened to his country and being transposed to a new kingdom. No, now it's going to be directly affecting him. So let's dive into the text and let's see the trap that starts to be set here, beginning in Daniel chapter 6. And before we even begin to talk about the trap that is going to be set, we need to talk about Daniel's character even here at an old age. As you begin here in Daniel chapter 6 there in verse 1, it pleased Darius, who was the king at this time, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these to appoint three governors, some of your translations will say three presidents, over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. One of the other things that we won't get too deep into this morning, Daniel has seen the transition of kingdoms even since he's been over here. Babylon has already fallen by this point, and now it's the Medes and Persians, and it's Darius the Mede who is the one in charge. It's the Chaldeans who are now the ones in charge. An entire kingdom has changed. It's no longer the same kingdom when he served Nebuchadnezzar. That kingdom's already fallen, and again, even at an old age, Daniel is recognized again by this new kingdom. 
So the king is in part of setting up this process of power and balances and check goes, I want to get 120 satraps, nobles, wise men, counselors, governors, same kind of idea that we might think of today. I want to choose 120 of the best men to be balances and checks to my power. I want wisdom and advice. I want to give them lesser things that they can be in charge of. I want men of good character, of understanding, who have proven themselves. And Daniel was one of those that stood out. A little bit further on, he goes, okay, I've got these 120. Now I want to pick three notable ones from that list. And I'm going to raise them up to be governors or presidents over the rest of them. So that now I, as the king, are mostly going to deal directly with these three governors or with these three men, and I will still deal with the satraps and still get their ideas and still get their knowledge and still get their wisdom and advice, but I'm not going to be in charge over them as directly I've put three other men in charge. Daniel is so distinguished that, okay, you're going to be one of the three out of these 120 I'm going to set up. And then a little more time passes, and we're kind of just probably skipping through months or years in these first three verses. Now, I've had these three governors, and now I want even more control over them. I'm going to set one above even the three. And if you pay attention to verse three, then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps, because he had an excellent spirit that was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Under an entire different kingdom, under different kings, he has proven himself again, just as he did back in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Just as he did back in the time of Belshazzar. Daniel, you have proven yourself again. There's a relationship here. I have seen your faith. I have seen your attitude. I have seen the work that you have done. And plans are in the work that I'm going to set one of you to be in charge of the whole kingdom. The governors will answer to you. The satraps will answer to you. You will only answer to me. Now you can imagine what kind of situation that begins to breed. Because now we get into verse 4. And okay, there might have been some envy of Daniel and the other two governors up until this point. But hey, we can kind of share the blame here and we can kind of share the envy here. And yeah, everything's fine, but at least there's three of us. Now the king is talking about setting one over all. It's going to start to paint a huge target on your back. So we jump into verse 4 of Daniel chapter 6. So the governors and satraps fought to sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Because if they could find an error or a fault, what could they do? We could either discredit him, and maybe one of us will be put up in his place, or, maybe even a better compromise, we can take an error to, or a fault to him and we can blackmail him. Listen, if we bring this before the king, then this could cause problems and you could lose your power and there could be issues here. But, if you'll still work with the other two governors or the other three governors at this point, because one's likely going to be a raise to fill Daniel's seat if he's risen then okay, it's going to be more like four of us are in charge, and yeah, you'll be the ones to make the final decisions, but you don't do anything unless you also discuss it with us first. Very common political type of attitude, isn't it? More than likely, that's what they're looking for. We need some way to find fault with him, either to discredit him, to make him lose all power, or find a way to blackmail and force him to work with us. There's just one problem. We have searched and searched and searched, and we can find nothing. It's not that Daniel ever made a mistake. It's not that Daniel ever sinned. It's not that he would have never done anything wrong. 
but there is nothing substantial that we can ever throw at him. If somehow Daniel ever cursed once upon a time, that's not going to be substantial enough to take to the king. If somehow Daniel ever had a lack of faith at some point, he's not going to be something to take to Darius that's going to completely discredit him. It's not that if Daniel ever made a mistake in writing proclamations or laws or a spelling error even, that we can take this to Darius. That's not going to be enough to discredit him. We have nothing. Those governors probably couldn't even say that about themselves. With Daniel, we have nothing. He is a problem because he's so faithful. So the men continue on with their thought process in verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this, Daniel, unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So, basically, we've got to make a problem. We have got to put something in place that is going to conflict what he believes and who he worships and what Darius and the Chaldeans have proclaimed as law. We've got to trap him. If we can find one flaw with Daniel, and it's really not even a flaw, but we can make it a flaw, it's that Daniel is faithful. So let's use it against him. And that's where we have the scene many of us probably know very well when we get into verse 6. So the governors and satraps thronged before the king. It's the idea, they just surrounded him and came at him quickly. And said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors, the advisors, they have all consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree. And whoever, whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish this decree and sign the writing, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. We've come up with a plan. We're going to get as many of our buddies as possible we're going to tell the king, listen, we have all discussed this. Kind of get the picture here. Daniel's not here because an interjection probably would have been made. Listen, we have all discussed this and come to an idea. This is a great idea. Everyone has to make a petition to you. They have to worship you as God. They cannot worship any other God for 30 days. We're going to make a new time period where the king is going to be worshipped as God, as he's already revered by pretty much everyone. But we're going to make a time period where it is illegal for anyone to worship any other god. If you notice a couple chapters back in the book of Daniel, this, was already, ha this already happened under the previous establishment. Except we don't get the account of what Daniel did during that time, although I highly doubt that he didn't, I highly doubt that he fell down and worshipped a Nebuchadnezzar statue. But we saw the account of what his friends did. Okay. You can make a command that everyone has to fall down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's statue that we put when the harp, the horn, and the lyre all plays. We're not going to do it. Got to wonder if these governors came up with a similar idea. <laughs> hey, I heard about the previous kingdom, and there was a king that did something like this, and they threw him into a pit of fire. It was so hot and fiery. People that came near it even died. Hey, we won't have that, but we have a den of lions over here that we throw some of our people into when they break, when they break your law. So let's come up with a new law. Let's make this an idea. Anyone who worships any other god will be fed to the lions. Sounds fantastic. Let's do it. And now we can find a way to trap Daniel. So the trap is set. And then Daniel starts to hear about the new proclamation that's being signed. Remember, this wasn't something that was done in secret because that would kind of lose some of the power of this account. Daniel is one of the three head governors. This is going to come across his desk. He is going to find out about this. It's not going to be a secret thing that this has occurred. And we notice that beginning in verse 10. Now Daniel knew 
Now, when Daniel knew, pardon me, that the writing was signed, he went home. He went into his upper room with the windows open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. We'll notice here about his custom that he's had since the early days, but it's interesting to me to know about this. Okay, I have just heard a command that the very thing I have been accustomed to do that I have done that everyone knows about has now been decreed illegal, what would we do? Some of us, I imagine, would stop entirely. Listen, God will understand if I don't pray to him and I don't talk to him and I make it known, I'll pray more like Nehemiah. As I'm going about, as I'm standing before the king everywhere that I'm going, it's that idea of I'm going to pray without ceasing. It's going to be in my mind. I'm going to pray to God, but it's not going to be this, maybe an outward sign that someone can notice. That might be our answer to that situation. It might be our answer to stop entirely and say, no, God will understand. I still love him. I still want to be in a relationship with him. I still want to prove my faith. But for 30 days, God will understand if I stop. Maybe that would be our reaction. I pray our reaction is like Daniel. There have been times past in this world and in various countries that parts of God's law and His Word and things we are required to do as Christians are outlawed. There have been parts of our country that have outlawed preaching certain things. And make no mistake about it, it will continue to grow. Even some of our own candidates are preaching and teaching on a platform that if I get elected, I'm going to do everything in my power to make it illegal to preach against things like homosexuality. I'm going to make it illegal to preach parts of God's Word because those people's rights supersede what God's rights say and what Christian rights say. So I'm going to do that. Make no mistake. It could happen this year. It could happen next year. It could happen 10 years down the line, but it is coming. It's already hit parts of this country. I pray our response is like Daniel. I was very emboldened by one of our elders in Crab Orchard growing up when he said there was a discussion in the Kentucky area that parts of Kentucky were going to outlaw preaching against abortion. He said, if that be the case, then we're just going to call the cops Sunday morning. And I'm going to be the first one to stand up and start preaching against it, against it, and it's going to be up to the cops. If they're going to arrest me, they're going to arrest me there, and I'm going to tell them, get a ban. Because I know the men of this congregation, they're going to start lining up one by one, and they're going to start preaching. And they're going to start teaching, and I guess we'll just have our services in the local county jail. Because there's going to be more of us that that than that jail is going to be able to hold. That seems to be Daniel's idea here. Not only did he go and pray, he prayed three times that day, following the same pattern he has done for as long as he has known since his early days. Despite the tribulation, Daniel put God first. God, how I worship you is not going to change. Sometimes when tribulation like this arises, yes, it can be our first instinct to shrink back. Daniel understood times have gotten hard. Pre praying to God has been outlawed for my people. Now more than ever, it is important I continue with this. Now more than ever, it is important that I remain faithful. Now more than ever, it is important that I keep praying to God. All things considered, my life's been pretty easy. Yes, 
I saw the desolation of my country. I saw friends and family probably killed when I was back home at a young age. Yes, I've seen friends thrown into fire since I have been here. Yes, I have seen friends and my people persecuted and put into slavery under various kingdoms up until this point. But all in all, my life has been pretty easy. Now I imagine he's not praying just for himself. He is praying for his people that are having the same question they're having to deal with today. The proclamation has just been sent out. You know what? I know it's a trap. And I might be the first one thrown into the lion's den, but the rest of my people are going to have a very hard decision today. They're going to be faced with what was custom for all of them to open their windows, to turn to George Jerusalem and pray three times a day. That was a custom that had been a thing for many people since their youth. So but so it was a thing back in the psalmist time. If you go back to Psalm 55 and verse 17, evening, morning, and noon, I utter my complaint. I moan and he hears my voice. You go through the Psalms and you look at David, you look at the sons of Korah, you look at the sons of Kohath, you look at some of the psalmists that we don't have a record of who it was that wrote their name. This same kind of idea is repeated many times in the Psalms. This was a pattern that many of the Jewish people, especially the faithful, had. That three times a day, whether we lived in Jerusalem, whether we lived in Israel or Judah, we turn towards Jerusalem three times a day and pray to our God. That was a consistent thing that many of them had done from an early age. And I imagine Daniel's not the only one that's had this habit in the entire kingdom. The point is, nope, this is not going to waver even if it has been outlawed. So, he keeps up his attitude, and wouldn't you know it, the other governors and satraps are what they're waiting Daniel 6 there in verse 11, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. It wasn't that they could go to Darius and just say, well, Daniel has always prayed, and so I imagine he's praying in his room right now. No, they knew the exact time and place Daniel would be three times a day. We're going to walk in and we're going to see him praying said he prayed three times that day. They probably missed the first two times he prayed that day. They walked in at some point, found him praying, and ran off to Darius. So we continue down there in verse 12. They go to the king. Then they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree, saying, Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Interesting the note there. What did they call Daniel? This governor Daniel. No, they didn't say that. This captive Daniel. One of the ones who came from Judah. No, this slave that was brought over and he's in your court and he's in your area and he's one you hold, regard, you hold in high regard. No, this captive is being so audacious as to pray to his God three times a day. Then we see the king's reaction. That he knows I have made a mistake. Daniel 6 there in verse 14, the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. If you know much about the Medes and Persians and you've looked into the attitude of that kingdom, Darius already kind of hinted at it. No, this is a law which does not change. It's the attitude. This has been written and decreed by a God, and this will not change. 
there's some more nuance to that and we can write a new law that contradicts the old law and it's written like a decree, especially from a God. But part of this 30 days deal was also part of the Medes and Persian law. That even for 30 days, it was very much a, no, you are not allowed to for 30 days even write a new law which contradicts the old one. No, for a month you have written this law and it is etched in stone. Not even the king can change it. And still, what did Darius try to do? Until the end of the day, taking as much time as he possibly can, he labored and purposed his heart. If there is any loophole or way I can worm Daniel out of this, I'm going to do it. Because of his faith, his love for God, his attitude even towards his own king, he set his mind, I'm going to do what I can for Daniel. He has done so much for me. But evening comes. The day is coming to an end. And king, you can't leave this till the next day. Something needs to be done about it right now. So in Daniel 6 and verse 15, Then these men approached the king again and said to him, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. They're pressuring the king. No, you know this king. We don't have to tell you, but we're here to remind you. They are itching so bad to see Daniel killed. While the king is fighting tooth and nail all day to save him. Just because he's faithful. Just because Daniel puts his God first before ambition, before moving up in power. Daniel wasn't the type of person that was fighting with the other kings and governors and satraps to move up in power. No, he moved up just by serving God and being faithful. And they hated that. They pressure the king, nope, you need to go right now. This cannot be changed. I don't even know why you're bothering to fight it. And so in verse 16, the king has to make the decision he really doesn't want to. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke to Daniel saying, Your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. The trap has been sprung. They've gotten what they wanted. Daniel's in the den. They're probably going home and sleeping tonight, rejoicing our enemy has been destroyed Maybe tomorrow we'll start fighting over who gets to be the next possible one over the governors. Until then, at least tonight is a night of rejoicing. Our goal has been met, but now we're going to see what the king does all night. Continue on to the next verse in verse 18. Now the king went to his palace and he spent the night fasting. No magicians were brought before him. Also sleep went from him. No one came to him and read from him the Chronicles as we noticed back in Esther when Xerxes couldn't sleep. No one came and played music for him. And while that could be for entertainment, usually it was because I can't sleep, so come and play some background music, play some soothing lullabies, play something that can help make me drift off to sleep. He refused to have anyone come in. My night is now spent in fasting, in prayer, and worry, praying that Daniel might be saved. That's how much the king couldn't sleep, and that's how much he loved Daniel. I fought tooth and nail all day to save him, and I still firmly believe that he will be delivered. Continuing on in verse 20, the king arose very early the next morning. He went in haste to the den of lions. Soon as the dawn breaks, as soon as the morning arrives, he is pelting towards the den. I'm going to see if Daniel is safe. When he came to the den in verse 20, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. He's hoping he's alive. 
Daniel! But he doesn't know. The king spoke saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the den of lions? Please answer me. I have to know that you're alive. Verse 21, that Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. He shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong to you. I can't even imagine the joy that the king is feeling right now. He spent all day trying within everything in his power to stop him from going there. He spent all night with no sleep, fasting, praying, hoping Daniel would be delivered. I can't imagine the exhaustion and the joy that overswept him at this moment. He's alive. His God did deliver him. The thankfulness sweeping over this king who is not a servant of the Most High God. He had faith in Daniel's God, but much like Nebuchadnezzar doesn't seem to put much stock in God, a king who is serving God would not have put that law into place. Still probably thought very highly of himself and thought of himself as a God, and I'm sure those laws that the other satraps and governors brought to him sounded appealing. Sure, everyone's going to put all their attention on me for the next 30 days? That sounds amazing. What it cost him one of his best friends, his greatest allies, and the one he could trust the most. And now the joy that Daniel has been delivered has overswept him. Daniel 6 there in verse 23 continues on. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him. He commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Immediately, bring him up. Roll away the stone. Take away the signet ring. Take him up out of there. They're not even fighting the lions to drag him out, and now they're waking up, and oh, there was food in here the entire time? We have no idea. No, God stopped the mouths of the lions. He went in there peaceably. He stayed there all night in peace, and he came out in peace the next morning. And as the king is rejoicing, now his mind turns back to the ones who put him in this predicament in the first place. The ones who by trickery, deceit, jealousy, and wrath proposed to put the man he wanted to be in charge of the entire kingdom in harm's way. Now, I imagine the king feels like a fool. They tried to trick me. It wasn't about putting me higher up. It wasn't about raising me up to a greater statue. No, they had ulterior motives. They wanted to make me look like a fool and put my own closest advisor to death. We see the result of that in verse 24 then. The king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel. They cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. The lions overpowered them. They broke all their bones in pieces before they ever even came to the bottom of the den. You just want a little bit more proof that the lions weren't asleep and they were already full before this happened? At least two men were brought here along with their wives and children. Possibly more, 
because we don't know exactly the number of how many men came and colluded against Daniel and tried to bring this message to the king. But there's at least two of them with their wives and their children. It'd be impressive to me to know, okay, there's this den of lions we have down here that we're keeping this pur purpose for basically our form of execution at the time. No, it'd be impressive to me that one man was thrown in and was torn apart before he reached the bottom. No, they were so hungry and starved for food, they were ready to eat. This was not a, oh, you know what, now I'm feeling a little bit peckish. No, multiple people were thrown into the den and they didn't even reach the bottom before they were torn in pieces. Daniel's enemies were punished and God made sure I am a vengeful God. I will make sure that justice will be done and my people will be protected. If you remember our series on Esther that we looked at last year, we saw a very similar instance happen to Haman. You remember Haman made those gallows that were 50 cubits high. He wanted to see Mordecai hanged so that just about at any point in the city, you could look and there is Mordecai hanging for the entire city to see. He put it as high up as he could build it. But after he has discovered that the vengefulness and the wrath was why he put the law into place through Xerxes. Oh, that it's also going to see Esther killed. Esther 7 and verse 10, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that they had prepared for Mordecai, and the wrath of the king was abated. A very similar situation is happening here. Similar situation is found if you turn over with me to Psalm chapter 7. The seventh psalm there, a portion of this is shown here, there in verses 14 through 17, as to how God looks at those who scheme and connive especially to destroy his people. And yes, this is David talking about Cush. This was a Benjamite, if you go back in David's history, that was trying to connive and destroy him. And Daniel is singing about one of his enemies here, but this applies to so many more aspects of life. If you'll turn back to the seventh psalm there, if you'll begin there with me in verse 14, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble. He brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out. And he has fallen into the ditch which he has made. His trouble shall return upon his own head. His own violent dealings shall bring down or shall come down on his own crown. And I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Knowing Daniel, knowing Esther, knowing David, they did not rejoice as far as vengeance was concerned. They rejoiced that by God's power, by his might, by the faith and relationship that they had, God delivered them from their enemies. Highly doubt Daniel was rejoicing this day that the men and their wives and their children were killed by lions. But he was thankful that God had delivered him from certain death. He was thankful that his faith was rewarded. But Daniel's attitude was much like his friends many decades before. If I go into the lion's den and I die, I'm just going home to God. It's not for a lack of faith or power by God that I'm going to die. And if I am delivered in the morning, and I don't think it's a far stretch that Daniel prayed all night, then it is by God's power and by his might that I escape. From a young age to an old age, Daniel was faithful. And because of Daniel's faith, Darius takes a second look at his life. Darius causes a new proclamation to be written and sent before all the people, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be changed. Continue in verse 25, you see the king talk about Daniel's God. 
Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every, dom dom in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is a living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Just as in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel's God was shouted to the ends of the earth. He continues to prosper. This is not the end. There are many more years that Daniel gets to live. He's already an old man, and his faith does not wane, and God continues with him until the end of his life. So the question for us this morning is, are we like Daniel? There are young people here this morning that can take lessons from Daniel chapter 6, from Daniel chapter 1, from Daniel chapter 2, all the way to the end of the book. There are older brethren here this morning that are much closer in Daniel's age in Daniel chapter 6 than I. You can take lessons from Daniel 1, Daniel 2, and from his early life, and you can take lessons from Daniel chapter 6 towards the end of his life. We can take a lesson if you back up to Daniel 6 there in verse 3 from Daniel's attitude. Daniel was distinguished above the other governors and satraps because an excellent spirit, because an excellent attitude was in him. Sometimes as we grow older in the faith, we can become very discouraged. We can have that attitude I talked about at the beginning of the lesson or I say, no, I feel like God has abandoned me. God has abandoned the country around me. God does not care. God is not helpful. I'm just going to keep going to services. I'm going to punch my ticket and hope I get into heaven. That attitude spreads. It's harmful. And it shows a lack of faith on our part when we start to develop that attitude. The effect and power of God was multiplied because Daniel, even in his old age, had a joyous, righteous, and faithful attitude and spirit. I want to have that attitude now, and I want to have that attitude as I continue to grow old, with however long God may bless me. I want to have the attitude of Daniel in Daniel 6 there in verse 4, that I deal fairly with others. He was distinguished above the other governors and satraps because of his attitude there. Verse 4, the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault in him because he was faithful. Nor was any error or fault found in him. More than just faithfulness to his God is found here. He was faithful in all that he worked on this earth. As part of his job as a governor was when satraps came to him, when individuals came to him, in many ways he was like a judge. Issues are brought before me and I deal with people fairly and I make a call. Here is how a situation is going to be dealt with. Here is how issues between neighbors and countrymen and even rulers and people below are dealt with. Like any government system, I think it's pretty safe to say there were corrupt satraps and governors that would take bribes. That would deal more in the favor of those that were higher in power with more wealth because they'd receive some kind of kickback. They'd receive some kind of alliance. No, we can't even bring that against Daniel. And you can pretty safely assume they did that themselves. No, we can't even bring that against Daniel. With everyone, he has dealt fairly. He looks at the issues that are brought on before him. He deals with the issue and deals with people fairly. I want to be like Daniel. 
I pray you do too. He was found faithful in spiritual things. He was found faithful in spiritual things. I want to be like Daniel that I am committed to prayer. That he had this habit from an early age. And it's not about the number of times he prayed, but it was the consistent attitude in his prayer. Every day, I am going to spend time communicating, establishing, and growing a relationship with my God. This was not the rote prayers of the Pharisees and Sadducees that Jesus condemned. There are religions that have borrowed whether this attitude or some other attitudes that know it's about the repetitious amount of times I pray or repeating a same phrase over and over again that makes me faithful. This was not the prayers of Daniel. He went into his room at least three times a day. More likely prayed other times beyond that. But at least three times a day took himself away from everything else opened the windows, turned towards Jerusalem, and prayed and spoke with God. I know it was more times than that because you look at some of the other chapters, especially after chapter 7 down through chapter 12, some of the visions and conversations and prayers he's having with God, that's more than those three times a day. That's another study for another time. But I want to have that prayer life like Daniel even until my old age. I want to be consistent and committed to my God until that old age. Finally, I want to trust God in all things like Daniel. He had a trust at a young age when he told the person that was in charge of the prisoners as they're preparing them for the king, take away the meats, take away the wines, take away the drugs, let us eat only fruit and vegetables. He had a faith in God. It wasn't a dietary thing. He had a faith in God when Nebuchadnezzar has him brought before and tells Daniel, listen, you and your household will be brutally slaughtered if you do not answer and interpret the dreams. Not only interpret them, you need to tell me what the dreams are. Daniel had a faith in God and a trust in God and gave all credit to God. And it was the same in the old age. The king was exceedingly glad for Daniel, commanded that Daniel should be taken up out of, the den, out of the den. And Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury was found on him because he believed in his God. Daniel did not sit there cowering all night, waiting for the lions to pounce and think at any moment God's power is going to wane and I'm going to die here. The picture painted of Daniel throughout the whole night, and we're not given much. No, the picture painted of Daniel throughout the whole night is God will protect me through the night. If I am down here for months, God can stop the mouths of the lions, keep me safe, keep me satisfied, and continue my life. God can bring people back from the dead. He can stop some lions. God can give Samson the might to rip a lion apart with his bare hands, stopping their mouths from devouring me is nothing. I want to have the faith and trust in God like Daniel until my old age and I depart from this life. I pray you have the same attitude. I hope these things have been encouraging to you this morning. Maybe they've challenged your faith and your belief in God, and maybe you've had times of frustration. Much like Daniel, we have things affecting us every single day that Satan is trying to challenge our faith. We have individuals that have vendettas out against us because we are faithful and no fault can be found in us. Not that we never make a stake and not that we never sin, but that we are striving within our power to serve our God faithfully. Hopefully these things have been encouraging to you and challenging to you and to remind you that no, we can remain faithful. If you want to have a life like Daniel from a young age until an old age, at whatever point that may be this morning for you, and you're not a Christian, 
then come forward and have the faith in God that He can forgive your sins this morning. Have the faith that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sins. Be baptized. Have your sins washed away and start a faithful and long life, however long God may bless you with, in service to Him. And know that when the trials, the storms, the tribulations, the attacks from other people come your way, that God is on your side and He will bring you through it if you will stand with Him. If as a Christian this morning, this week, this month, and times recently, you have lost sight of that, your faith has waned. Pray to God and ask Him for strength. If you need to bring those things to brethren's attention because we're here to listen and help and encourage, come forward and ask for the prayers of the saints. If your faith has waned so much that no, you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that it has brought shame upon the church and upon God's name, then come forward and confess those things as He commands. Make your life right with God as a Christian this morning. Again, we are here to uplift you, to pray for you, and to help you so that we all remain faithful into a ripe old age, just like Daniel, until our time on this earth is over and we can go home to be with our God. Whatever the case may be this morning, if the need calls for it, please come forward now as together we stand and sing the songs that have been selected. <laughs>